so glad that you've joined us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Our hope is that you would be both encouraged and challenged in your relationship with Jesus. Be blessed as you listen to this week's message. So today we are jumping back into the series, You Asked For It, where we're giving you an opportunity to ask your question. Normally, I'm preaching, and it's a lot of my opinion and what I'm learning from God. And I want to, we want to spend this month, and we're going to ask the questions that you have. So um, if you haven't already sent in a question, you can send them in. Go to anchorchapel.com slash questions, and you can submit one. And if we have time, we may get to some today. If not, we'll save them for uh, another week coming up in the future. So I'm here with Brooke, my wife. And um, she's amazing. She's got some great insight, especially in some of these questions today. And then also my bud, Mike Henderson, has been just such a great friend for me. And, um, and he's going to also, he's going to host it, ask these questions, but also help us to answer some of these as well. And here's the reason why we do it. 2 Timothy 2.5. 215, be diligent and present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. We want you to know how to search scripture, how to find the answers to the tough questions that culture is asking today. We, we're, we're not about just forming your opinion on, well, I just feel like this or I've observed this. We want to go to scripture. You're going to see every answer that we have. We're going to go straight to scripture and see what the Bible says about these things. So we want to equip you and hopefully be an example on how to find the tough answers in life because there's a lot of them out there. So let's go ahead and jump in. And Mike, why don't you lead us off? Good baby. morning, Anchor Chapel. Uh, I'm enjoying this series, and I hope you are too. It gives us a chance to get some input into uh, the services and uh, the sermon, so it's cool. All right, first question, and uh, it's a, a fastball. Uh, the subject line is gentrification, and the question is, how hard is it for the church to go out when building a foundation for a fully functioning church family of all races, In what direction should the church deal with race here in Baton Rouge? Been in an interracial relationship, is there a concern in the church to reach out and adapt or become knowledgeable of racial differences? Well, I think it's a great question, and it is one that can be, uh, it could be dicey, but I think it's one that the church especially needs to address. I just want to talk about first, the question doesn't really mention gentrification, but I want to just talk about what that is, just in case uh, you haven't heard that term or you're not really familiar with it. But, uh, the internet defines it as uh, the process of renovation of a deteriorated, deteriorated urban neighborhoods by the means of influx of more affluent residents, meaning that there may be a poor community um, that in the efforts to improve the community, um, there are businesses that are put in or homes are renovated to try and make that environment, that neighborhood a better place. But what ends up happening is many of the residents that live in these areas that may not be able to afford this new neighborhood have to move out and they get kind of kicked out of what they grew up in. So a lot of times this can be very discouraging for the residents here. And there's going to be some times where people are going to... Um, they, they may end up saying, you know, this, this seems like a good thing for sure, but listen, I'm, I'm not, I can't afford this new lifestyle, so this isn't good for me. And that's where it gets to be dicey. Some of us may look at it and say, well, that's great. If you're middle class, though, you've never felt what some of the poor neighborhoods feel. Now, I mean, in Baton Rouge, this is predominantly going to be, our demographics show that it's mostly going to be black neighborhoods. In other cities, it may be different. So along those lines of gentrification, you know, I think that this is something that I think the whole answer to this question, we're going to, we have to talk about intentionality and relationship is where the, the answer for this comes. Um, but as a church, how do we even, how would we answer this? What would be a solution that the church could bring to this problem that many poor neighborhoods face? Yeah, I think the issue is, like you were saying, it's dressed up as a good thing for the poor community, for a black community, but it really isn't. If I can only work in that community, but even though I work there, I can't afford or save enough money to actually live there, that's uh, discouraging to, to me. That's discouraging, discouraging to us. So uh, as, as a small church as we are, what we can do is when we have our outreaches, when we go out into these poor black communities, we can talk with them and speak hope into their lives, speak uh, value into their lives. Uh, the issue is uh, with education. You know, uh, if you feel like high school is it, that's as far as I can go. Uh, college is not an option for me. So that means that economically, I don't have the resources or the, the, the vehicle to be able to move into that community. So if we speak, say, hey, you know, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be this, you can be that, and just and speak hope into someone's life, that makes a difference. You know, later on, we may be able to do some type of uh, 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 
uh, reach where outreach where we're uh, teaching, you know, uh, value skills, yeah. things like that, uh, how to fill yeah. out a uh, FAFSA form, you know, things like that. You know, they may be normal and uh, common knowledge for you as far as financial aid, but in these uh, communities, it may not be that way. Yeah. So you think, I can't afford to go to college. That's not an option. So yeah. I think that's something that we can do. That's good. That's yeah. a good answer. So let's look at the question. So when it comes to having a diverse church here in Baton Rouge specifically and opposing racism, what does that look like and what can we do? So I just, I believe, and I want you to hear this from me, I believe our church should look like our city. Every church should. Now our city, whether you realize this or not, this is interesting. If you look up demographics in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge is 55% African American, 36% Caucasian, 3.5% Asian, 3% Hispanic, and just a few outside of those percentages. So when you think about that, if you think about what a diverse church should look like, if our church really looks like the city, we need a lot more black individuals here. We need a lot more, and we need a black community presence here in this church that needs to be part of our family. And I want that to be part of our family. And I think it begins with, you've got to talk about relationship. You've got to talk about intentionality and having, and not just doing this thing to create a show or like, it's like this has to be, it has to be, has to come from authenticity. So what could that look like for us? How in the, how, do we do that? How do we be intentional and how do we include and how do we grow a church that is more racially diverse? Right. Yeah. And if I look around right now and if you look around, you'll miss, see that we're missing parts of our body. That's yeah. good. And we need to reach out to the black community. Yeah. And the, the deal there is we have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. Now, just to let you know that the black community is very welcoming to white people, other races that come into our, our community as well as uh, our organization. So, you know, just to relieve some pressure off of you and the fears, you know, it's okay. We're mm -hmm. going to be okay with you coming in <laughs> and welcoming of you. Um, the, the issue is that, you know, as far as us coming here into this environment, I'm more comfortable and most black people are more comfortable with seeing other black people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of rooted in racism and segregation, but, you know, so many years ago, it was not okay or acceptable mm -hmm. or even safe for a black person to be around a lot of white people. Mm -hmm. So we have prejudices as well as I know you have them as well. So we have to kind of get past those things. So I'm asking you, hey, let's be intentional. Let's go to these communities. Let's speak. Let's talk. Let's spend time. Build some relationships so it's easier for them to come in here and say, hey, I know that person. I know that person. I feel a little more welcome uh, when I come into that environment. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, and I would say, you know, 95 and maybe even upward of that percent of the people that come, that visit Anchor, come because a friend. They check off the, the box that says, a friend invited me. There, and so I would think, but the problem is that if you're white, oftentimes all your friends are white. And so it really does need to happen on a relational level, that we're, as people, you know, that we're making friends with people, with, with black people, with people of other races, and that gives us an opportunity not only to have them as part of our life, but, but to invite them into church as well. Right. Yeah. I have a good example. Uh, if you think about Coach O and Go Tigers. <laughs> but uh, outside of Louisiana, he's kind of looked at as a cartoon character, kind of like a Bobby Boucher type thing. <laughs> but if you think about it, when he goes outside of Louisiana, when he goes and visits the ESPN offices to do shows and stuff like that, he's been, he, I'm sure he feels this way, but he's been judged based on the way he looks and the way he talks. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, uh, when he goes to one of those studios, if he runs into a guy, a lady from South Louisiana, there's that instant connection. You know, say, hey, I don't know who you are, but I know you're from Louisiana. You know about gumbo and jambalaya. So <laughs> we have that connection. So if you picture it that way, you know, that's why we like to see other black people here. And I want to see other black people here. Absolutely. And you should want to as well. You should say, hey, we got to do something about it and be more intentional about it. That's good. I think you said something really well that part of our body is missing. I think, look at 1 Corinthians 12 says this, for if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. And I think what this reveals and illustrates is that 
There are parts of our body, there are people, there are black people in our communities that need for us to do the hard work of relating to where they are. There might be something that you hear, some story that goes on, some kind of an issue that happens in culture that you're like, well, that's their problem. That's not me. Or not. Why do they feel this way? Well, you've got to have relational equity with someone and begin to ask. Mike has been this guy for me. Well, we've sat down a couple of times and I've been like, explain this to me. Show me, show me how... Show me how I should respond. Teach me how you feel right now. I want to know. I need to know better. Um, so I, you've got to have somebody in your life where you're like, listen, I don't really know everything. Because Brooke and I are white pastors. We're not going to know a lot of the culture and a lot of the maybe some of the fears that black people have. So we've got to ask. It's got to be relational. So our, our position as a church is we always want to oppose racism. Mm -hmm. And anything that any opportunity we have where we can sympathize with the black community, with any pain or feeling that they may have or fear, we want to go out of our way. We've got to meet them halfway. Think about it. Like, like Mike said, if a black person walks in through these doors, they've already done a brave thing. Mm -hmm. They've already gone out of their comfort zone. We've got to meet them halfway and say, hey, let's get lunch today. Let's connect. I want to get to know you because this thing is going to take work. Because you're going to hear outside of church all these lies and these struggles and these things, and you're going to believe things about each other that aren't true. If you sit down and talk with each other, you'll find out they're a lot more like me than I thought. So we've got it. I think that's one of the ways. I think that's something we have to do. Without conversation, you're not going to have just this osmosis happen. Like, you've got to sit down and, and love each other. So um, Yeah, I'll say those prejudices that we have are based on our experiences, mm -hmm. uh, maybe our parents, our aunts and uncles, things that we've experienced in our lives. Mm -hmm. And they aren't always true, you know? So there's that fear there of taking that, that next step. And uh, part of the question was talking about interracial couples, and that's becoming more and more socially acceptable. But uh, I, I would say applaud those. Yeah who have gotten past their own prejudices yeah. to say, hey, we're people first. You know, right. we're, we're the human race mm -hmm. first. And they're more richer and better for it because yeah. they found each other. So it's the same thing with us. Let's get past those prejudices yeah. and, uh, you know, let's break some bread, talk, and uh, talk some, about some tough questions. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for an opportunity to get out of your comfort zone, tomorrow night we have our monthly outreach at Ben Burge Park, and it's in a predominantly black community. It's a great way for you to build relationship with people, so get out of your comfort zone. Go out and meet. Man, these people are amazing. Yeah. So get out there and go make some new friends. So, yeah. um, we're good? All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, on. let's move on to the next question. What does it mean to be seated in the heavenly realm with Christ? So I think this is a really good question, and it's kind of one of those it's a verse that in Ephesians 2, 6, the verse was also submitted. And this is what the verse says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And it's kind of one of those verses that you could read over and be like, that sounds great, but never really think much about it. But there's a lot of this, some incredible depth in here and just a beautiful picture of what grace is. So if you're going to find out what something like this means, this is what we believe. Scripture interprets Scripture. If you're going to find out more about Scripture, then you have to find it in Scripture. I don't think that your emotions can, can determine what, scriptures, what Scripture really means. You can't even take that from culture today. You might not even take it just from one voice. You've got to hear, you've got to hear what Scripture says about Scripture. So I want to look at what the Bible says about this theme seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So in, Ephes in Hebrews 10, it talks a lot about Jesus as our priest. And this is what it says in Ephesians 10, I mean, Hebrews 10, verse 10. By this, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and he is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So what this illustrates and what this verse in Ephesians means, it means a couple things. There's a picture of how God is outside of time. And this is hard for us to wrap our brains around. But right now, even though right now all we see is this linear time frame, we are seated with Christ outside of time. Meaning that what Jesus did for us on the cross has paid for every past, every present sin, every future sin we will, we will ever make. And we are still seated and we are safe with Jesus in heaven, seated with him. So outside of time, our salvation can be secure and trusted because it's on Jesus, not on us. So that's a beautiful picture of how Jesus grace is outside of time. Another cool thing is that it says in Hebrews that time after time, every day, the priest would work trying to make atonement for the sins of God 
God's people. Well, Jesus, when he went to the cross, after the cross, he sat down because his work was done. You would never, a priest was never allowed to sit. A priest had to be working constantly and they would rotate shifts. But a priest, even though they couldn't sit, Jesus, our high priest, is now seated because the cross was the final work. Once and for all, all of the work for our atonement is done. And the really cool thing about this is not only is Jesus seated, but we're also seated in heaven, meaning that our work is done. We don't have to work for our salvation. Our works come out of our love for him, not of our striving for his approval. But everything that we get, everything that we that we get out of this life today and following Jesus, it's all lanyap. It's not like we're not earning anything else. We're seated because we're done. And Jesus is seated because he's done. So everything is finished in heaven, outside of time. It's, it's a beautiful picture yeah. of grace. Yeah. I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. The whole outside of yeah. town, outside of time, we're there and we're here at the same time. That's, that's pretty comforting and relieves yeah. a little pressure off of us. Yeah. All right, let's move to the next question. And uh, this must be from a Yankee, I'm sure. But uh, it says, I know y'all had to wait a long time before you adopted your two children. And y'all struggled with in- infertility. Y'all are such an inspiration. How did y'all find so much strength Do your infertility, through your infertility, and wait for your two blessings? I'll take this first. Um, Josh and I actually have sort of different stories concerning this because we're, we're two different individuals. And, you know, so for me, I, the, the seed of adoption was planted in my heart early on. So before we even, Josh and I even met, when we were engaged, we had this conversation because I had this desire of wanting to adopt. And so, you know, I just kind of said, hey, if we're going to get married, this needs to be okay with you. You know, this needs to be something. And we kind of agreed on that. So that was planted in my heart. Now, I would go, you know, we didn't, we were married 13 years before we adopted our first child. That's a long time. Um, And that's a lot of longing and a lot of waiting, uh, a lot of you know, just hope deferred. You know, the scripture says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Um, but I had this early in our marriage, maybe five or six years, I think, after we were married, the Lord gave me a promise. And I wrote that promise down. And this promise was this, that you are going to have a son and his name would be Judah. And so I, I held on to that promise. I clung to that promise. And I really believed in my heart that God is faithful to his promises, and he would be faithful to it. And so for me, that helped me in those seasons of, of deferment, you know, that I had something to cling to and hold on to. And so when, you know, adopting our kids for me was a calling. I felt God drawing me and calling me to do it. And for Josh, it kind of took a, a little bit of a different course. But Yeah, I was nervous about it. I didn't want to do it. I always thought that we would have our own kids first, and then we would adopt later, and it would be this picture-perfect thing. We'd go on a mission trip, meet this kid. Oh, they need a home. Well, we need, we don't have a kid. So, you know, it would be something like that. And it just didn't work like that. And, and after years and years, we had heard about the foster system. We couldn't afford a traditional adoption. And Brooke's like, why don't we try this? And I was from the beginning, I don't want, I don't want all that baggage. I don't want my heart to be toyed with, like have to maybe lose this kid. I can't deal with that. We started going through the classes even, and I was like, I remember we had a little fight one day during lunch of, during one of these classes, and I was like, I'm not about this. Like, I don't even know why we're going through these classes. We're not doing this. Like, it's done for me. Like, you're not going to, we're not doing this. And um, it really took a miracle. Like, God had to work on, on me, and one night, Brooke had to end up staying home, and I went to a, one of the foster classes on our own, and they're showing all these pictures, and I see this picture of this kid, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this kid needs a home. So I came back, and I was like, Brooke, this kid needs a home. And uh, it didn't end up being this kid came, stayed with us for the weekend, but they didn't, he didn't end up staying with us, and we didn't adopt him. But it opened up the door for, uh, for me to be open to what God wanted to do. And I'll say this, especially through the foster system, it is gritty, and it is sloppy. You, and kids come with baggage. Mm-hmm. But, but you have to be willing to deal with that. Yeah, so do we. <laughs> but I think that yeah. that's one of the things that you have to, you've got to be okay with it because... Here's one of the things that challenged me. It's not just like, am I, you know, you hear people talk about, and I, and I used to think this way. Well, I'm not really called to do that. I'm not called to be an adoptive parent. I'm not called to foster. Actually, you are. You're called to do something. In James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. Look after the orphans and their widows and their distress and keep one 
unstained from the world. Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphans, fight for the rights of widows. I think there's a clear mandate in scripture that we take care of the forgotten, and that's going to be kids too. And you might not feel like you're maybe your age or maybe financially you feel like you can't do it, but you can do something to help the cause of the orphans. So that's why today we have the the heart gallery set up. You can find out how you can either begin to, um, you can go through the adoption or foster system, or at the very least, you could sponsor a kid in Honduras through One Child Matters or through Living Water in Albania. We just gave come back from, or you can find a foster family in our church. We've got a few and hook those kids up for Christmas. Do something to take care of the orphans. We all have this calling, and I would just challenge you, even though it's not going to be comfortable, it never will be. Get out of your comfort zone because it's so worth it. It's a blessing. Yeah, and I would say that I think oftentimes we can look at adoption as like a plan B mm-hmm. or like just like an afterthought. And I know for, for me, my kids, they're no plan B. They are a plan, they are plan A. They are prime, they are optimal, they are, they are, you know, they are God's perfect plan for us. And there's nothing secondary or second rate about them. And so, you know, adoption is awesome. And the gift of adoption is amazing. I mean, we think about the gift of adoption we've been given as children. We've, God has adopted us into his family and we're not second rate and we're not an afterthought, but he thought of us from the beginning of time. He thought about us and he knew us. And so for our kids, it's been just the most incredible experience. And so whether you have kids, you've, you've naturally had kids, you know, like this is, you know, this is this can still be for you. This can still be God's plan A for you to adopt kids and to welcome them into your family. And so, you know, we just always want to challenge people to open their hearts to it because it can be scary and it could be uncomfortable. But for us, it's just been an awesome, a really awesome experience. It has challenges, but hey, if you're a parent in this place, every every parent has challenges. You know, parenting is difficult. So that's good. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say plan A, that, that was a good thing to say. Um, God always has plan A for us. We may think what we want, this is what I need, and our hope may get deferred, but um, trust that God has that plan A in mind, and he'll make a way no matter what. All right, let's move on to our next question. It says, I've been trying to make a point to listen to more worship music lately. I've noticed the common theme of the name of Jesus. I decided to delve deeper into rediscovering the power and holiness of his name because I feel like this is an easy thing growing up in such a desensitized society which uses his name so freely, even as a curse word, unfortunately. My question is, what advice or scripture do you have to help us hold reverent the name of Christ and the person behind that name for that matter? And keep it holy in a society that is so nonchalant with such a powerful name. Well, I think one of the reasons that this happens is we don't assign power and authority and meaning to names like the ancients did. When you think about what Jesus' name was to the early church, and in Acts 17 it says that Paul was arrested because he professed allegiance to another king named Jesus. And this was seen as treason against Caesar. Now, all of the early church, this is how they saw the name of Jesus, that he was willing to die for, not just because of a name, but because of what the name represented. And I think that, yes, it is important for us to to refrain from using God's name in vain. If I'm watching a movie and I hear, I can hear the F-bomb and it's going to make me shudder a little, but when I hear somebody use the name of Jesus, it's like, oh gosh, it's there's such power in that name, such meaning in that name that you don't get. And, you know, I think refrain from that, absolutely. But I think that there's something even greater when it comes to representing and honoring the name of Jesus. I think this is what it's about. Second Thessalonians 1, Paul says this, so keep, we keep praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of the Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. And you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our Lord God, um, because of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So I think the best way we can honor the name of Jesus today is by honoring what he commanded us to do. 
go into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that everywhere that we go, we bring the church of Jesus Christ with us, that the church continues to grow. That's what he died for, and that's what he left in our hands to continue to grow the gospel message in this world. And I think that our lives represent the name of Jesus. So let's steward that well. Let's honor the name of Jesus by the way that we live. And and I'll say, as far as changing society, uh, it starts with our children. You know, even with my kids, you know, I teach and instill in them that, you know, the name of Jesus, name of God is very uh, powerful and should be honored. So even when they hear somebody else using his name in vain, they're like, I can't believe that happened. But also... Uh, I have to teach them and show them through my life and my actions, you know, how to follow and walk like Jesus did. So good. Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Anchor Chapel. If you'd like to support the ministry of Anchor Chapel, you can easily do so on our website at anchorchapel.com. You can also follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Be blessed and we'll see you next week.